الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد ما دي برضو سيستس بيجين ويت دي كلام الله سبحانه وتعالى وير الله سبحانه وتعالى سنت صلاة وسلام عن النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وير الله سبحانه وتعالى سيد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد it is the right of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that his ummah must send salat and salam on him not because he needs it because this ayat is proof that he does not need it because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already sent salat and salam on him and therefore the salat and salam of the people is has no precedence or value over that but we send salat and salam on rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because it is the uh, rule and it is the responsibility of the ummati to pledge allegiance to his uh, to his uh, nabi and that is why we send salat and salam on rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and we the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed us that the one who sends salat and salam on rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam once allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send salam on that person 10 times so this is the again this is the izz of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that if somebody sends salam on his nabi once allah will send salam on that person 10 times and therefore the more we recite durood the more we send salat and salam on nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam the more beneficial it is for us and that is the reason we send salat and salam because it is his due and it is his right and because it is beneficial for us uh, today inshallah we will try to <coughs> talk about the uh, qualities of the life of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i have uh, uh identified 10 what i call jewels from the sira the sira is full of them it is not as if there are only 10 but uh, it is my um, whatever i understood that i have tried to keep that as concise as possible so we can complete that in one lecture the reason for this the primary and most important reason for this is because of the challenges that we as the muslim umma are facing in this world today these challenges that we are facing in the world today are by no means new they are not even particularly difficult when compared to the challenges that this umma faced and was able to uh, to uh, win those challenges in the past so the umma has faced uh, far more difficult situations but for each uh, individual what happens during his or her lifetime has primary importance so no matter that we can talk about our history uh, what is real for us is our present and therefore no matter what uh, the muslims did during the time of uh, the mongols or what the muslims did during the times of the uh, earlier than that break up of the abbasi khilafa and so on and so forth uh, is at best of historical value uh, it is something that we can we can and should learn lessons from it is something that has value in terms of learning but that is not our personal experience our personal experience is what is happening to us today and what is happening to us today is happening at two levels it is happening at a global level and it is also happening at a personal level the what's happening at a personal level is a factor of what we encounter on a day to day basis ourselves as well as what the global the, the effect that global events have on our hearts and minds when we see them on television or we read about them and so on both of these are simultaneously working on our psychology 
So it's very important. The reason I'm saying this is it's very important not to get um, bogged down by this, not to feel discouraged by this, not to get depressed by it. Uh, it is nothing to be depressed about. Well, Alhamdulillah, all challenges and everything that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes with only khair. It comes to strengthen us, it comes to wake us up, it comes to draw us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it comes to wake us up to the reality that we don't live in this world alone, that all that we do in this world reaches and stays with us when we go into the next world and therefore all of these challenges are really wake up calls for us to straighten ourselves, correct ourselves and go in the right direction. So Alhamdulillah all of this is good. And Alhamdulillah also that if this results in uh, as it is happening in Syria and so on, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect uh, the Ummah and protect all of us and protect all innocent people, Muslim or not Muslim, from all forms of oppression. But if at some point in time you reach a, you reach a place where you have to die, well, the, the, you know, the good news is that you have to die anyway. So it's nothing new and it's not the something that uh, would not have happened anyway. But what will happen, that if you are ever killed, if I am ever killed, and this is the dua we make, that may Allah give us shahada. So we make the dua for shahada, you, you have to expect to die, that's the only way you get shahada. So if you die and if you are killed because you are a Muslim, that is what, we have seen several incidents like that. The, the latest one that I heard at least was of the uh, shahada of uh, the Imam in uh, Queens in uh, New York, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him Jannatul Firdaus he and the, and, and the brother who was killed with him. So if if you are killed for the reason that you are a Muslim, then Alhamdulillah it is Jannah. It is Shahada, it is uh, Maghfirat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so therefore this is nothing to, there is absolutely nothing in the world as it is happening, which is a reason to be frightened, which is a reason to be scared, or which is a reason to be depressed. So please understand this very, very clearly. And also watch your language, because many times I've seen, uh, you know, videos, interviews and so on, which are taken uh, of people in these incidents and uh, somebody says, you know, this is very scary, this is very scary. What's scary? So watch your language, don't say things like scary. There's nothing to be scared about. What, what's scary? What is there to be scared about? So, uh, you must be very clear. Now, I mean, if you have Iman, if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you believe in the Akhirah, there's nothing to be scared about. We laugh at this, Alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this very clearly in Surah Al-Ahzab, when the, when, uh, the forces of uh, Abu Sufyan, the Quraysh and the, uh, the people who were with them, or they gathered all the tribes of Arabia, they came to attack uh, Medina, and it was the largest army ever assembled uh, until that time. Uh, the Munafiqun of uh, Medina, this is exactly what they said. They said, we are scared. And they tried to scare the Muslims as well. And they tried to tell them, see, this is where Muhammad Sallallahu led you. Because you followed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is where you are. Now the whole of Arabia is against you and so on and so on. What, what was the response of the Muslims? And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentioned this very clearly in Surah al -Hazan. The Muslims said, Sadaq Allah wa Sadaq Rasulullah. They said, what we were promised, Alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then said, the only thing it increased was their imanan wa taslima. Imagine, Allah said, it didn't increase their fright, because they were not frightened. He said, the only thing that increased was their iman and their taslim, their submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the position of the Muslim when faced with adversity, when faced with danger, when faced with uh, any kind of force uh, which threatens to uh, annihilate them. Because we understand, annihilation or non-annihilation comes from Allah, not from whatever is in front of us. That is why Khalid bin Walid looking at the forces of the Romans in Yarmouk, the largest of the Byzantine army which was uh, assembled, 200,000 soldiers, 100,000 Roman soldiers, 100,000 uh, Christian Arab soldiers from, from Byzantium, from Byzantium. Khalid bin Walid laughed. Somebody, somebody say, what? You are laughing. Anyway, you, what's wrong with you? you are, don't, don't you see this army here? Khalid bin Walid said, they are all dead. So first you laugh, then you make a statement which makes no sense. I mean, what do you mean they are all dead? He said, what do you mean? He said, Rasulullah said, the one who has no Iman, he's dead. Eh? He said, they are dead. Who's, who's, who's afraid of dead bodies? What is there to fear with, from, from people who are already dead? 
So Alhamdulillah, we wish the best for all the world and we continue to work for the best of all the world. But please do not ever allow words like this to come out of your mouth. You are not scared. Nobody is scared. So don't even say such things. We are scared. Scared of what? It's Alhamdulillah. What's your position? Alhamdulillah. This gives me an opportunity to showcase Islam. This gives me an opportunity to show what Islam is. This gives me an opportunity to practice Islam in such a way that people can see Islam. The time has come when we have to be able to say what the Sahaba used to say. And what did they used to say? They used to say, Kunu Mislana. Become like us. This is the time. We need to be able to say that. Look at us. Somebody says, what is Islam? We have to be able to say, look at me. What is Islamic business like? Come to my business, I'll show you what it's like. What is a Muslim home like? Come to my home, I'll show you what a home like. What, what a Muslim home is like. That is what we need to do. And this is the area where, having said all the nice things that I said, we have to now say some not so nice things. This is the area where the maximum amount of work needs to be done. Because we are very far away from the standard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Whether it is in our normal daily lives, whether it's in incidents of uh, times of uh, celebration, whether it's in times of uh, grief, whether it's in festivals, whether it's in marriages, whether it's in our businesses, we are very far away from the standard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. And that's the reason why I thought it's uh, important to remind myself and you of what is this standard. And inshallah that's what we will attempt to do. To Just to give you a list of the uh, qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, And this is not in order of precedence, although I would say that mercy is the number one quality, no doubt about that. But it's not as if one is more important than the other. It's a list of ten things. Um, mercy, arising out of which is forgiveness. Uh, which comes from confidence, which comes from courage, uh, which comes from sabr, which is fortitude, uh, resulting in rida bil qada, whether we see success or we see failure in worldly terms we have, we are not only, not only do we accept it, but we are pleased with the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu, generosity of spirit, an abundance mentality, kindness, truthfulness, and trustworthiness. These are the uh, ten qualities that uh, are visible from the seerah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And these are things which as in everything in Islam, these are things which are the keys for success in dunya wal akhirah. In Islam there is nothing that uh, is gives us success in the akhirah at the expense of success in the dunya. This is not in Islam. In Islam, what gives success in the Akhirah also gives success in the dunya. What gives failure in the Akhirah is also failure in the dunya. Both are equally true. So this is something that we uh, need to be clear about because a lot of times people feel that somehow if they uh, follow Islam fully that they will fail in this dunya even though they may succeed in the akhirah. This is the root of all corruption. This is the root of all our problems in life where we leave therefore what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to do and we take up things that Allah has prohibited us because we feel somehow that if I don't do that I will fail in this world. No, you will fail in this world if you disobey Allah. You will fail in this world and you will fail in the hereafter if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you follow the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will succeed in this world and the next world. So be very clear in your mind. Now, um, why must we study the seerah at all? What is the benefit of studying the seerah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayat karima of... Um, of Surah Al-Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ بَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to those who claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, emulate me, make, follow me, make my ittiba, imitate me, in which things? How much? It's a blanket open statement. Imitate me, emulate me, in what? In everything. 
Allah did not say emulate, tell them to emulate you in salah, tell them to emulate you in business, tell them to emulate, em, em, emulate you in your uh, uh, domestic life at home or as a head of state or as a head of the army, no. Emulate me in everything that I do. Then what will happen? What is the result? What is the value of emulating Muhammad Rasulullah in everything we do? Then Allah will love you. See the beauty of the ban of the Quran. Allah is not saying then you will be successful in this world, then you will be successful in the Akhirah. No. Then you will get Jannah. No. Allah will love you. And that's why I always say we need to sit with the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take this one ayah and take that one phrase, Yuhbibkum Allah. Allah will love you. Just sit with this phrase. And imagine what is the meaning of Allah will love me. That's why the karam of Allah is not simply to be, you, you read the, you read the, we don't even read the meaning, may Allah pro protect us. But even if you read the meaning, please don't think that that is the, your job is done. It's, it's not even started. If you, did, if you did not read the meaning, then I don't know what, what to call it. But even if you read the meaning, we need to sit and reflect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this, Afala ya tadabbarun al-Qur'an. Allah did not say, Afala ya qrawun al-Qur'an. Allah didn't say, do they not read the Qur'an? Afala ya tadabbarun al-Qur'an. Allah said, do they not make tadabbur on the Qur'an? He didn't say, don't they read the Qur'an? No. Do they not reflect on? What is tadabbur? Tadabbur is to sit and think and reflect and go inside yourself and say, what is the meaning of Yuhubibkum Allah? If Allah loves me, what does it mean? How, how does it feel? And how will Allah love you? Only one way. Find me anywhere else in the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this term, Yuhbibkum Allah, with anything other than the emulation and the ittiba of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Find anywhere. In jihad fi sabilillah, Allah did not say Allah will love you. In salah, Allah did not say Allah will love you. In hajj, in umrah, in uh, fasting, in uh, khairat, in sadaqat, Allah did not say Allah will love you. All of these are wonderful activities. All of these activities, inshallah, on Musa'an will get us amazing rewards. But Allah did not say Allah will love you. Allah said Allah will love you only and only in one thing. And what is that one thing? Emulation of Muhammad Rasulullah Ittiba of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Gets you the Hubba of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu And it's not somebody's claim It is not me saying this out of my love for Allah And his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam No This is the kalam of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Jalla Jalaluhu Even Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Did not say this Allah himself said this Yuhbibkum Allah Is whose kalam is the kalam of Allah. Even if, even if Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had promised us this in, a, in any hadith, we would have believed it without any problem. But this is the actual kalam of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Yuhbibkum Allah. Because you make the emulation of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the reason why. And then what happens when that happens? Yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Which, which sins? Like everything. Yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Allah will forgive your sins. How many sins? Everything. Wallahu ghafurur rahim. That is the reason why it is important, absolutely critically essential to study the seerah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because we need, please sit and reflect on this thing. We need the love of Allah. How much do we need love of Allah? We literally need it even more than we need life. Because this life can give us one of two things. This life can give us insha'Allah Jannah. This life can give us insha'Allah the opportunity to do good deeds. But this life can also give us Jahannam. Potential is there. Potential is there. We ask Allah to save us from that. But potential is there. But the love of Allah? The love of Allah can give us only one thing. The qurb and hubb of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Success in this world, success in the Arab No doubt about this 
That is the reason. Because how can you emulate something you do not know? Why must I study the seerah? Because I have to practice the seerah. And that's the reason why we study the seerah. Now, the qualities of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu the which I mentioned, as I mentioned there also, there is not, it's not a mutually exclusive list of qualities. They are all intertwined, they rise out of each other and therefore they are uh, composite in that sense. Second thing is that it is unique to Rasulullah that simultaneously he had all of these qualities. You might find for example somebody who has uh, a lot of, uh, you know, very kind heart but they are not particularly courageous. You might get frightened of things. You might find somebody who is extremely courageous but the heart is hard. The, the heart is hard. It happens quite, quite often. People who are uh, physically uh, very brave, uh, they have a lot of trouble being kind. They might feel that but you know, the heart, heart becomes hard. That, that's a, it's, not nece- it's not necessary that should happen but it tends to happen. Uh, you might have somebody who uh, has a lot of knowledge uh, but one of the uh, things which we need to guard, uh, which come with knowledge, is arrogance. So, not of knowledge, but then no humility. With Rasulullah all of these qualities which I mentioned are were with him simultaneously, and that is why this is one of the um, unique things about the Prophet Sallallahu And also, Alhamdulillah, it is true for all the Salaf Salihin, for all the Sahaba, for all uh, people who are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the more you know them, the more you love them. Normally this is not true. In, in, in English we say, uh, familiarity breeds contempt. So people look nice from, from a distance, but uh, when you get close to them, then you discover they have feet of clay and you know, you discover things about them which are not complimentary and so uh, you are... Uh, you, you, there's a disillusionment. I mean, you know, oh my God, I thought this person was so wonderful and then I discovered that he's actually not that great. But with the Prophet Sallallahu this was not true. The more people got close to him, the more they, uh, they used to love him. Um, thirdly, Rasulullah Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave us Rasulullah Sallallahu as an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an example. Uh, his uswa hasana, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to follow. And this example good for all time. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with special qualities that would give him this, that would make him this wonderful example for all of mankind to follow until the Day of Judgment. This is the beauty of Muhammad Sallallahu character that you don't even have to be a Muslim to follow and to become like Muhammad Sallallahu Obviously, in the most critical aspect of being like Muhammad Sallallahu is the issue of Tawheed, it is the issue of worshipping Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala but in terms of his character, in terms of his manners, in terms of his uh, Muhammad in his dealings and so on uh, anyone can behave like Muhammad Sallallahu and you have a beautiful example to follow. And we have a, even in this world today, which is a particularly nasty and corrupt world that we have, but even in that world today, there are many examples, not one, there are many examples of non-Muslims, people not, who are not even Muslim, who, are, who behave like and who have some of the aspects of the character of Rasulullah even though they Even though they don't say that what they are doing is that they are following Muhammad They are not saying that. But you can see the reflection of the character of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of kindness, of compassion, of honesty, of integrity, of courage in those people. In some cases it is in those societies, in those countries and you have a beautiful system that people are living in. So even today this is true. Now imagine how much, uh, more, how much more necessary it is for Muslims to be like that. We are not only supposed to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are supposed to become because of guidance uh, for everybody else. And that's the reason why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily for you, the true example is the example of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I submit to you my brothers and sisters that the 
success and longevity of people and civilizations is not in their lifespan but it is in the ideas that they come with it's not in material wealth but it is in their spirituality it is in their connection with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you look at uh, the great civilizations of the world the civilizations have gone a long time ago but what has lasted what has lasted are the ideas that they came with and that is also true of the islamic or muslim civilization and that's the reason why we need to focus on ourselves look at our own spirituality look at our own connection with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla and this connection with allah comes through the emulation of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we were talking about mercy as a quality of uh, as the number one quality of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam now mercy comes from mercy is the very reason why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin now if you see, if you if you look at this ayah in uh, its sense of grammar allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is starting with nafi like in the kalima la ilaha there is no one worthy of worship illa allah except allah which serves to emphasize the statement that is being made so even here allah is saying wa ma arsalnaka and we have not sent you illa except as rahmatan lil alamin as a mercy to all of creation rahmatan lil alamin not even all of mankind so not only is allah not saying wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil muslimin allah is not even saying wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lin nas allah is not saying we sent you we did not send you except as a mercy for muslims we did not send you except as a mercy for human beings no wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a mercy to all of creation all that we know and all that we don't know exact nature of this mercy how is he a mercy to jupiter and how is he a mercy to uh, the stars and how is he a mercy uh, to the sky and how is he a, we don't know the how exactly but we know the statement of his rab jalla jalal who is also the creator of jupiter and the stars and the mars and and and, and, and uranus and so on that he said jalla jalal hu wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin that allah subhanahu wa taala said that he said nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said we have sent you as nothing except a mercy to all of creation and that's the reason why uh, we have to study the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam now the mercy of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is famous there is uh, quite literally no example that i can give you which uh, which can Uh, which has a parallel in today's world because if you look at the life of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam his entire period in makka uh, the period of risala not the entire uh, his life in makka but uh, the period of risala is a period where he received only opposition he received only bad treatment he received only oppression from his own people you know one is to face oppression and one is to face uh, tension and so on from strangers it's not nice but it is comparatively easier to bear because you say well you know these are strangers will what what else do we expect but to have to face that from your own people that is very difficult because you have an expectation that you know you this is my brother this is my friend this is my so and so and now you you get ill treatment from them and that is very painful and that's what he got he got the worst treatment from his own people the closest to him abu lahab who was abu lahab abu lahab was his own uncle and when we say uncle we we must understand the meaning of uncle father's own brother in the arabian cultural tribal context today we don't have that i mean it's very difficult for people like us to even uh, understand that because we do not have a, a tribal culture or at least we don't have a, that kind of tribal culture we have a, we, are a, we have our own version of tribal culture uh, but we don't have that kind of tribal. so it, an uncle there is quite literally in the position of the father even till today if you go to arabia if you go to uh, 
the non-urbanized uh, Arabs, and I have some family, I have some very dear friends in, uh, in in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere who are Bandhu, who are who, you know people from the uh, people of the of the soil, and uh, to see them behave, to see the young people behave with their uncles, to see them, it's amazing. I mean, it's unbelievable. You can, you, you haven't even. You, I, I can tell you very clearly that in this country, in India, you do not even know the meaning of Adam. You haven't even smelt the, the fragrance of Adam. You don't even know what Adam means. You want to see Adam? Go to the Arabs. Go and see how the Arabs who are true to their tradition, see how the young ones behave in their family to the elders. Even today, despite all the change and all the corruption and what not, uh, there are these things which are there with them. So you can imagine what this must have been in the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there, somebody like that, who I have respected so much and who I have treated like this, now turns against me and becomes my voice telling me what kind of pain. And that's the reason why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said every, um, every Nabi suffered uh, in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Every Nabi faced pain. And he said, I have faced pain more than anyone else. So if you think about it now, you must say, well, you know, uh, there were Ambiya who were physically beaten and tortured and killed and so on, but that didn't happen to Mr. Sallam. He did suffer some of that, like in Taif and so on, but it didn't happen in that context of, you know, being in prison, throwing it, thrown into prison like Yusuf Ali Salam or uh, being tortured and so on. So what was the suffering? Now, that suffering is psychological suffering. It is mental suffering. It is suffering of uh, breaking of the heart. Uh, the, 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 you have to understand the wusat and the strength of the heart of a Nabi and this comes directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens the hearts of his Anbiya because without that the work of, of the Bubat cannot be done and that's the reason why it's very important for us to develop this uh, mental and spiritual and psychological courage that comes only and only with connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we really want to be Muslims and if we really want to do the work of Dawah if you want to continue to work in the face of discouragement, in the face of opposition, you have to have a very, very big heart. Otherwise, you cannot survive. So, this is the mercy of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Take some of the hadith, for example. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's famous hadith, which all of us have heard many times. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said there was a woman who had a cat, a pet cat. She locked it up. Uh, the cat couldn't get access and she went off somewhere and the cat couldn't get access to food and water and so on and the cat died and Allah will give her Jahannam for that. A cat. The woman didn't murder the cat. The woman was careless about the cat. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there was a thirsty dog and he was trying to get some water. Water was, at, water was at the bottom of a well. A man was passing by. He saw this dog in this state of wanting to get water. So the man he had no, uh, you know, he had no utensil, so he, he tied a, a string to his shoe and he dipped the shoe in the well and he brought the shoe up and he gave the water uh, in the shoe to the dog to drink and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give Jannah to this man for this reason, giving water to a dog. I am giving you these examples because there are many other examples of the, of the mercy of Nabi Sallam, but Umar sallaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Rahma also for the cats and dogs. Rahma also for the trees. Rahma for the environment. Rahma for society. Rahma for everything. So even though this may look like a small action, it shows that it's not a small action. Every action that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a big action. Every action that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also a big action. So don't imagine that it's a small. That there's nothing small. Because it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّعَةُ اِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنُ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Allah said, the good deed and the evil deed are not equal. They cannot be equal. So what must you do? Repel the evil deed with he ahsan, with something which is the best. So if somebody does something evil to you, what must you do? Re repel that. Give that back with something which is the best. Then what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Then the same person who was your worst enemy will become your greatest friend. Now in the life of Mr. I want to give you 
I can give you many examples, but let me give you one. One of his worst enemies, one of his biggest enemies was who? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan. Till the end. Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu did not leave a single stone undone in trying to malign the reputation of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in trying to harm him physically, in trying to kill him, he did everything possible. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala protected his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so Abu Sufyan could not succeed, but he did. He did everything. One of the one of the most wonderful stories in this context is Abu Sufyan's meeting with Heracles, the uh, king of the uh, Byzant, Byzant, uh, king of uh, Byzantium, where um, Heracles heard about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said to them, he said to the people, uh, who are these people who claim that a prophet has been uh, sent to them? So they said they are these Arabs. So he said, find me some of those people. Now it so happened that Abu Sufyan and a few of his, pe- a few of his uh, companions, they were in uh, Palestine at that time, they were trading. So the Romans came and they found them and they brought them to Heracles. So in the court, of the uh, Eastern Roman Emperor, um, Heraclius said, who is the leader among you? So Abu Sufyan said, I am the leader. So he said to Abu Sufyan, come forward. He said to the people, stand behind him. I am going to ask him questions and if he tells a lie, then you signal to me. So now Abu Sufyan is in a funny situation where he is in front, he does not know what people are doing behind his back. And the king has said to them that if this man tells a lie, signal to me. So Abu Sufyan got, you know, he was in a position where now he, he, it was a very dicey position. So Heracles asked him, and this is one of the stories of the Sira which uh, we, we should read and we should study. He asked him a lot of questions. See the question. For example, he asked him, who are the people who follow him? Who are the people? So Abu Sufyan said, only the poor. The people who follow him are people who are poor, who have, who have no place in society. Now Abu Sufyan is giving answers which are true but also the answers which he hopes will turn off uh, Heracles. Eh? So here the king of the Romans, if, who, who follows this man, eh, nobody important, all these poor people. Then he said, uh, have you ever had a conflict with him, meaning in war, have you faced him in war? Uh, Abu Sufyan said yes. He said what was the result? Abu Sufyan Madalana said, sometimes he wins, sometimes we win. So his, perhaps his intention was, you know, if he was a Nabi, he would win all the time. So sometimes we win. So what kind of, what kind of Nabi is this? Who loses in, in, in war? So Abu Sufyan is trying to do as much damage as possible, right? Uh, so similarly, he asked him many questions. Then uh, Heracles asked him and said, have you had a treaty with him? And this was after Sulaim Hudaybiyah. So, uh, Heraclius said, uh, Abu Sufyan said, yes, we have a treaty with him. He said, has he broken the treaty? So, Abu Sufyan said, not yet. Now, see this. <laughs> he could have said he is not broken, but he is not yet. Meaning that there is a possibility, he might break it. Later on, now, the result of all of this was that at the end of that, Abu, uh, Heraclius said, this, all of what you have said, are the characteristics of a true prophet. Yeah. Heracles was a learned man, he was a Christian. He said, all of what you have said are the characteristics of a true prophet. He said, even Jesus, who followed him? The poor. Who are against him? The wealthy. And he said, Abu, and, and Heraclius said that if I could meet him, he said I would wash his feet. Hmm? He, he never became Muslim, but this is what his statement was to Abu Sufyan. Now, later on, Abu Sufyan Radhiallahu said that in that whole conversation, I tried to do as much damage to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as I could, but the only thing I managed to say was not yet. I couldn't say anything else. Now the reason I am saying this is, here was a man who treated Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi so badly. But what was the treatment of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi to Abu Sufyan when Abu Sufyan was in his power? See, one is to be nice to somebody because you really have no choice. What will, what will you do? 
whoever is being nasty to you is too powerful, so you can't do anything to him. You, maybe you can make faces behind his back or something, but other than that, what can you do? But the point is that when somebody who has harmed you is in your power and you have absolute control over what you can do to him, Rasulullah could have had Abu Sufyan killed, he could have, uh, you know, have, he could have, have had him executed, he could have done anything he wanted. After Fatah Makkah, Abu Sufyan Madalana was in his control, was in his power. Now, Mr. Hassan didn't have to do it personally, he could have simply signaled to somebody, they would, it, would have, it would have been done. But what did he do with Abu Sufyan? He forgave Abu Sufyan Madalana. He announced and said that Abu Sufyan and his family are safe. He said, whoever goes into the house of Abu Sufyan, whoever takes refuge in the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Abu Sufyan Radhalana said, Ya Rasulullah, my house is not so big, all the people of Makkah cannot come inside. He said, whoever stays in his own house is safe. Just don't come out into the street. Because he, did, he didn't want clashes and he didn't want a civil war happening in the, uh, in the night. So he said, just stay inside your homes. And he said this on the prompting of Abu Sufyan Radhalana. What was the result? Abu Sufyan Radhalana became one of the greatest supporters of Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The ayat of the Quran. Same thing with Khalid Walid. And I mentioned that elsewhere in this, uh, in this series. But same thing with Khalid Walid. Same thing with Amr Blas. Same thing with Al-Wahshi Radhalana. Returning, please understand, to return bad for bad is justice. Meaning that if you are harmed, to demand compensation, to demand retribution, to demand that the person who harmed you should be punished, this is the law. There is no, nothing to feel apologetic about that, there is nothing to uh, hesitate about that. It is your right. If somebody murders uh, someone you know close to you, if you're part of the family, then it is your right to demand compensation. It is your demand. It's your right to demand that the person, uh, that the the culprit, the murderer, must be uh, executed. It's your right. If you say that, the Quran gives you this right. But then the Quran, having said that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "But if you forgive, I will get jannah." This is the beauty of, this, of the kalam of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Even where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is prescribing the punishment very clearly Allah then says but if you forgive and if forgiveness in Islam is what? forgiveness in Islam is not only will you not insist on the person's execution you will also not even take blood money free the person for the sake of Allah and that is what Rasulullah emulated so mercy which we expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jala jala lo, is not justice. Mercy is positive injustice. Mercy is to give more than is due. Mercy is to give more than what is due. We ask Allah for His mercy. We do not ask Allah for justice. We don't ask Allah for Adil. We ask Allah for mercy. We ask Allah to forgive us even though we do not deserve forgiveness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us Jannah even though we do not deserve Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us even though we do not protect the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us even though we do not do anything to help his deed. That does not mean we continue like this. We will do our best inshallah, make that near, that we will change our ways. But we will obviously never fulfill the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet we ask Allah Jalla Jalla to forgive us because that is His shan. Allahumma inna ka afuun kareemun tuhibbul af fa'afu anni. Fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are the one who forgives and you are the glorious one. And you love to forgive. Therefore forgive me and forgive us. Oh Allah, forgive me because that is what you like to do. Not because I deserve forgiveness. Forgive me because you like to forgive. Indulge your shokh. Make yourself happy. What makes you happy? Forgiveness makes you happy. So forgive me. And my used to say, Baat banti hai, meri kya tera bigarta hai. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and that's what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for and for that it is necessary that's why Rabbi Sallallahu said show mercy to those on the face of the earth and the one in the heaven will show mercy to you we go to the next one which is forgiveness and forgiveness is that quality which comes out of mercy the first thing to understand about forgiveness is that forgiveness is only possible when the crime has been established there is no forgiveness possible when somebody has not done anything wrong right so if I come and tell you please forgive me like many of these people they send this when they are going for Umrah or you know before Ramadan or something this, this <laughs> message or whatsapp if I have done anything forgive me what is the meaning if I have done anything have you done or have you not done if you don't even know whether you have done or not done, what are you asking forgiveness for? So forgiveness, the question of forgiveness arises only when the guilt or the crime or the offense has been established. The reason I'm saying this is that many times if you tell somebody, well, forgive the man. What do people say? Mune karana. Are karana People say, oh, but he did know, he, he, he harmed me. That is why we are saying forgive. If, if he had not done anything, what are you forgiving? So forgiveness happens only when the crime or the offense has been established. Number one. Which means what? That punishment is deserved. That you can give punishment. You have the power to give punishment. Or to see that punishment is given. Yet you choose to forgive. And that's why forgiveness is such a wonderful thing and that is why this is the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla jalla. Crime is established, we have transgressed against Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to take intiqam, has the power to take revenge, has the power to give punishment, but Allah chooses to forgive. And this is the quality that Rasulullah sallallahu had. Take many examples, but take five. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes there. What is his intention? I am going to draw attention, uh, draw your attention when we come to Rida Bil Khadar to some of these things. So remember that. What is his, is his intention good or bad when he is going to Taif? Good. Is his intention for himself or is it for Islam? For Islam. He doesn't have to go for it. He is not going to Taif to create another kingdom or you know to get some more votes or something. No. He is going to Taif only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla. Can you question his sincerity? Was he sincere? Did he have a class? Dumb question. Well, if, if the Prophet sallallahu had no class, then who has a class? So all the factors. Did he make enough effort? He could have sent people at that at the time Rasulullah sallallahu went to went to Taif. Abu Bakr was Muslim. Amar bin Yasir was Muslim. There were many Muslims in Makkah, and people who were significant people. It's not as if they were only you know people who had no power. There were people who were significant, highly respected, recognized. He could have sent any one of them. He could have sent a group of them, but he chose to go himself. So here we have a situation where intention is beyond question, sincerity is beyond question, uh, purpose is beyond question. Effort is beyond question, but what is the result of that journey? I don't use the term failure because it was not failure. What the, what the Prophet did, did was not failure. But the worldly situation, the circumstances that he, fa that he faced were circumstances which were all negative. He was abused, he was reviled, he was assaulted, he was wounded. All of this happened. Physically that we can see. What happened to his heart? How did he feel that in his spirit? Allah only knows. That's between Allah and his Nabi We are talking about forgiveness. So now, crime established. Beyond doubt. Next issue. Do you have the power to retaliate? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Jibreel alayhi salam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam goes into the uh, into the garden and I'm not I'm not telling you the whole story in detail first of all because you know that secondly we don't have time in this lecture inshallah understand when we have time we do that some other time but he went into this garden he was given some water and some grapes and so on and so on then he falls into sujood and he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
And he makes the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes his condition, he describes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how weak and powerless he was and what he tried to do. And then he said, but I will continue to work hatta tarda until you are pleased. He's not saying that, you know, I'm sorry, you gave me this job, can't be done. Assalamualaikum, find somebody else. No. He's saying, I will, con- Ya Allah, this is all what happened to me, but Ya Rab, I will continue to work. Hatta tarba, until you are pleased. If the whole world is displeased with me, it doesn't matter. As long as you are pleased. And if you are not pleased with me, then it doesn't matter if the whole world is pleased with me or not. Makes no difference. What was the result of this dua? Jibreel A.S. comes. Along with Jibreel A.S., another, mal- another malak, another angel comes. Jibreel A.S. says, Ya, ya Rasulullah, your Rabb has heard your dua. And your Rabb has sent this malak. He has sent this angel. And he has put this angel under your command. Command him and he will do whatever you tell him. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, who are you and what can you do? He said, Assalamu Alaikum Ya Rasulullah. I am the malak, I am the angel in charge of the mountains. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what can you do? He said, I can join the two mountains on either side of Taif. He said, there will be no Taif. There will not even be a memory of Taif. He said, every living thing in Taif will be finished. These people have harmed you. Your Rabb has given you this power. Crime established. The power to retaliate established. And remember, if Rasulullah had used this power, would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask him a question? No. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the do with this. So now after doing this, would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, why did you do? Where is the question of why? Do this. What was his response? He said, my Rabb has not sent me to kill people. My Rabb has not sent me to kill people. He said, my dua to my Rabb is that even if these people do not accept my message, that their children should accept my message. <coughs> and of course, history is witness that happened. Even those people accepted Islam after some time, but then their children, from among whom is Muhammad bin Qasim. He is Takhafi. One of the greatest generals of the of the Banu Umayyah. Fatah Makkah, same story. People who troubled him, people who uh, were, were they, 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 they killed his daughter, people who uh, confiscated, took away his wealth, not only him, all of the people who migrated from Makkah to Medina, their wealth was confiscated, they were harmed, many of the Sahaba of Rasulullah died. Okay, so I can understand you did not ask for those who killed Sumayya radiallahu anha or Yasir radiallahu anhu. Huh? Abu Jahl killed them, Abu Jahl had already been killed in, in, uh, in Badr. But what was wrong with asking for compensation for property which was, you know, unjustly confiscated? What was wrong with asking for, for compensation for money which was taken? Okay, you didn't ask for yourself, ask for the people. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is commander of an army, he can order it and it will happen. What does he do? He stands on the door of the Kaaba and he calls the people. So now they come running. Because now he is army commander. So then he says, what shall I do with you? So they say, Antal Kareem, Ibnul Kareem. They said, you are Kareem, you, are, you have Izzah and your father has Izzah. Hmm? Same people who forgot all of that when they were chasing him out of Makkah. But now he has power so. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Antumul Tulaqa. Today you are free, go. He recited the ayat of Surah Yusuf, which Yusuf Alayhi Salaam said to his, to his uh, brothers. He said, today there is no blame on you. Now he says, today there is no blame on you. Go, you are free. And that's why the people who 
were in Mecca at that time are called at tulaqa They are called the freed slaves of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because according to the law of the land, when a city was conquered, it was the law of the land that the men could be killed and that the women and children could be taken as slaves. Nabi sallallahu alaihi did nothing of that. Not a single person was killed. Nobody was enslaved. He did not even ask for compensation. That is the meaning of forgiveness. Khalid bin Walid, responsible for not the death of one person, but the death of 70 Sahaba in Ahad. 70 Sahaba. Among whom is <coughs> Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib al Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uncle and because he was uncle by relation but he was the same age as Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he was a companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one of his greatest and closest companions one of his greatest supporters a huge strength to Islam he also died in the same battle so Khalid Walid is responsible for that when Khalid Walid comes to Medina what is the treatment of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he hears when they tell him that Khalid and Amr ibn Nas are coming to Medina he orders and says nobody will say anything to either of them which is criticism because 70 people who died their families are in Medina he said no one will say anything they will not criticize it one of the greatest enemies of Islam the two of them come Rasulullah stands up from his place and he puts his shawl on the ground and tells Khalid to come and sit on this shawl. Rasulullah to the best of my knowledge from my reading of the seerah, he did this only on two occasions. One was for Fatima to Zahra his daughter, who he loved so much, and the other one was Farid Wali. He stood up to receive them and he put his shawl on the ground and he made them sit on the shawl as a mark of honor. Who is he doing it to? And then it doesn't end with that. He then makes Khalid ibn al Walid the commander in chief of the army. And it doesn't end with that. He then gives Khalid ibn Walid the title of Saifullah. And the same Khalid ibn Walid, Fatirana, many years later, many, many years later, Khalid ibn Walid is dying. And he's dying in his home, he's dying on his bed. The last moments of his life. So he's crying. A friend comes to him and he says, Why are you weeping? Are you afraid of death? Khalid no he says, Me afraid of death? He said, I looked for death. He said, I went searching for death. In every battle. He said, Allah is witness. There is not an inch of my body from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet which does not have the wound of a sword or a spear. So every single part of my body has some wound taken in some battle. But today I am dying here in my bed like a camel. Like a camel dies in its stable. He said, I wanted shahada fi sabilillah in the path of Allah, in the battlefield, fighting against the enemies of Islam. But today I am dying in my bed. That's why I am weeping. And so his friend said to him a wonderful thing. That's the reason why it is good to have good friends. Friends who are connected to Allah and friends who have wisdom. His friend said to him, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you tarajat, inshaAllah. He said, but remember this. He said, your fate was sealed. The day Rasulullah gave you the title Saifullah. He said, your fate was sealed the day Rasulullah called you the sword of Allah. He said, how can the sword of Allah fall in battle? Huh? He said, you could not have been killed. You could not have been killed. No enemy could have killed you after Rasulullah gave you this title, Saifullah, sword of Allah. He said, your fate was sealed the day he gave you this title. You had to win. 
you had to be safe in battle would yes but nobody could kill you how can the sword of allah fall uh, good to have good friends because they come to your aid when you need them final story of forgiveness somebody went to alwahshi of the land among the tabi this is after mr sir passed away some young people went to him they said please tell us how did you kill hamza radhiyallahu anhu hamza bin abdul muttalib was not a what was not a usual person he was one of the greatest warriors of the time he used to like ali bin abi talib he used to fight with both his hands he was ambidextrous he used to fight he used to have, use two swords he did not use a shield he used two swords so he was a great warrior he was a great expert swordsman uh, he was a wonderful archer when he came back from uh, one of his hunting trips and they told him that uh, abu jahl and so on had been uh, troubling and they had tried to harm rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he walked with his ears carrying a bow he walked with his bow into the haram and uh, abu jahl was sitting there and hamza bin abdul muttalib slung slammed his head with the bow and he cut him here and he said how do you how dare you do anything to my nabi muhammad he said i accept islam now la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah and do me do something to me let me see who, who can do anything to me alone nobody dared touch him so they asked him how did you manage to kill this man so alwahshi radhiyallahu anhu he said i will tell you the story just as i told the story to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wahshi radhiyallahu anhu was one of the people for about whom rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had passed sentence he had passed sentence after fatah makkah on seven people and he said that these must be killed they must be executed for the crimes that they had committed and he said even if they are found hanging from the kiswa of the kaaba even if you find them holding the the cloth of the kaaba kill them but the actual reality is that i think if i'm not mistaken only one of only one was killed all the all the others he forgave the trot but where she was one of them now so where she said when this uh, when this happened i left makka and i went away and uh, i was planning to go off somewhere else to some other country or something and he said some of my friends told me how much will you run where will you run because he went to taif after makka he went out to taif and he said after taif then there was battle of hunain taif fell so he said then i left taif i wanted to go after abyssinia or somewhere so one of my friends he said some of my friends told me look how much will you run where will you run some day somebody is going to find you and then you will die you will you will be killed what is the point of that so said, go accept islam make uh, apologize to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he will forgive you so why she said i covered myself up completely so i could not be recognized because he has to first reach nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam somebody recognizes him on the way he is dead so he covered himself completely and he said i went and sat in front of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said he extended his hand and he said i have come to accept islam nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave his hand wahshi accepted islam then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said who are you so he said i removed the cover from my face so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam recognized me but he did not rescind his order so he said now you become muslim so he is forgiven he said he recognized me and then he asked me how did you kill my uncle so wahshi said i told him i said ya rasulullah i had nothing against your uncle I had no fight with him. I had nothing against you. I had nothing against Islam. He said I was a slave. And he said only a slave knows what is the meaning of being a slave. He said my master, my owner said to me, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam killed my uncle. So if you killed his uncle and Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't kill anybody, what the man meant was that this uncle died in Badr. So he said if you kill the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I will free you. He said, "Ya Rasulullah, I was slave. For me, freedom was everything. There was no way otherwise that I could be free. So this was a once in a lifetime chance." He said, "I am a spearsman. In our country, in our culture, the Abyssinians said we are very good at 
throwing the spear. I'm a spearman. So he said, I took my spear and I went to Ahad. He said, I did not go to fight anybody. I had only one job, one purpose, which was to kill Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. So he said, I, in the battle of Ahad, he said, I did not engage with anyone. I didn't fight with anyone. I didn't kill anybody else. He said, I went looking for Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. He said, I found him in a place where he was fighting and he said his eyes were everywhere. He was totally alert. So he said, I hid, I sat down, I crouched down behind a rock and I hid from him. He said he was fighting a man and he said he was fighting with both his hands with, his, with, his, uh, with swords and he said he, he cut the man across his body. The man laughed and said, you missed. He said, Hamza said, take a step forward. He said, the man took a step forward and he broke into two. Now imagine the force of that blow of the sword, where the sword went through the whole man's body from one end to the other and the man didn't even feel it. That was Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. What he said, he said, at that time, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib relaxed. And he said, the moment he relaxed, he said, I stood up from behind my rock and I threw my spear. He said, the spear entered him this way and went through his body. He said, he turned around and looked at me and he said, I was terrified. He took a step towards me, but the wound was too much. The spear was through his body, the wound was too much. He could not stand, he fell down. But he said, I was afraid even to go close to the body. So he said, I waited until I was absolutely certain that he was dead. He said, then I went to the body, I retrieved my spear and I went home. That's it. I went back to my camp. He said, I didn't fight anybody. I did not do anything. This is what happened. Now, who is Rabbi Salaam talking to? He's talking to one of the greatest enemies, somebody who caused him so much harm. Rabbi Salaam wept and wept and wept. He kept the body of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib and he read Salatul Janaza on all the 70 Sahaba. So, Abdul Mut Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib's body, the Salatul Janaza was read by Rabbi Salaam 70 times. Then he buried him with his own hands. What does he say to us? Does he say to us, you are enough, forgive you, get out of my life. I don't want to see your face. Vanish. Did he say that? What did he say to him? He said to him, when you come into my majlis, he didn't say don't come. He said, when you come, he said, sit to the side or sit at the back. Because when I look at you, you remind me of my uncle. So that pain becomes new. Eh? Even then, he is not blaming the man. Even he doesn't say, I don't want to see your face, you know, dirty face, get out of here. No, no, no. He is talking about himself. Even then, he is not even blaming the man, even then. He says, When I look at you, it's my problem. He says, It's my, it's not your problem, it's my problem. I feel bad. The pain of my uncle's death gets revitalized. It becomes alive again. So when you come, please sit to the side or sit at the back. He does not prevent Vashi from looking at the Nabi, which is Ibadah. Which is Ibadah. He doesn't prevent him. Come. Come. Pray behind me. Come listen to Tilawat Quran. Come listen to that Durus. Come listen to this. Many, many years ago, many, many years after that, Vashi took part in the battle against Musailma al Qadha. And Vashi said that my one aim was to kill Musailma. And he said, in the end, Musailma al Qadha was killed by Abu Dujana with the sword that Rabbi Sallallahu had given him. It was the Prophet sword himself. And Vaishi said at this, at that instant I threw my spear and my spear killed the man. So he said that if my spear killed the man, then he said that spear killed the best of people, the best of men, and it killed the worst of men. So he said, I don't know because 
Abu Dujan also came at the exact time and uh, he hit the man with the sword. He said, but if it were my spear, which was responsible for the death of the man, he said that my spear, with that spear I killed the best of men and I killed the worst of men. This is the meaning of forgiveness and that is the reason there is reward in it. Because it is something which is not natural. It is something that comes only because of this wusat of the qalb, this greatness of the heart, this kindness, this amazing nobility of character which Rasulullah demonstrated. Third point is the issue of confidence. Now, the very first incident of Rasulullah where he announced Islam. I have said this many times before that if uh, somebody came to you or me with this particular issue to say look I have to make this announcement to people which is going to go completely against the grain of all that they believe in. They are not going to like it. There is no way that they can like it. But I still have to do this because I have taken this job. What is the best way of doing that? I can guarantee you everyone and ev everyone but everyone will say only one set of things and that set of things is first win the hearts of people, first make friends and we do this in Dawa. I, mean, I say this all the time as far as Dawa is concerned because like, there is a, there's a logic to this. It's not, it's not some foolish statement. It's, there's a logic to it. There is, there is Quran for this. So, we say gain some support and once you have that support, then you make whatever declaration you have to make. But what did the Prophet Sallallahu do? Of course, he didn't ask me or you for advice, but he did what his Rabb Jalla Jalalu had commanded him to do. And he stood there and he announced. Now, this Waz is uh, is like an alarm call. Hmm? It just it calls people for some uh, danger, some great danger. So he calls him, he stands on uh, the hill of Safa and he makes this announcement. He goes there and he stands on Safa and he calls people and when the people come, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes this announcement. What is the announcement? He first tells them, he said, if I told you, see he is establishing his credibility. He says, if I told you that there was an army behind this mountain which was ready to attack you, would you believe me? They said, yes, we would believe you because you are a sadiq al -Amir. You are the truthful and the trustworthy. We believe whatever you tell us. You have never lied to us and so on. So having established his credibility, he says, therefore, now please listen to me. I am the same one, the same sadiq al -Amir. I am telling you that if you do not leave this idol worship, if you do not leave polytheism, and if you do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu, if you do not worship only Allah without partners, then you will go to Jahannam, you will have a bad ending. So save yourself from the fire. Now, Rasulullah is making a statement here where he is going completely against the grain of all that the people believe. Ask yourself why is he doing that? How is he able to do that? And the only answer to that is, it comes from a complete and total faith and belief in the fact that you are correct, that you are right. Now you might say, well, you know, you can also be, you, you, know, you can also believe that about things which you are wrong. Confidence is not necessarily you can people who do wrong things also believe that they are right. Nobody actually does a wrong thing believing it is wrong. So what is the difference? But I can tell you one thing that. The level of confidence that I am talking about can only come with right, does not come with wrong. You can have some confidence with wrong, but the level of confidence that the Nabi had وسلم, which enabled him to make this kind of announcement can come only with haq. Only when the heart is completely and totally at peace with the fact that this is the truth and nothing else but the truth. Remember also that uh, this unshakable belief. Now, also remember that 
کانفیڈنس از ڈفرنٹ فرام ایرگنس اعتماد کیور نہیں ہے اعتماد میں اور کیور میں فرق ہے کانفیڈنس از ڈفرنٹ فرام ایرگنس کانفیڈنس از ٹو ہیو کمپلیٹ فیتھ اینڈ ٹرسٹ ان یور سیلف ٹو ہیو اے سینس آف پرائڈ ان یور آئیڈینٹی ایرگنس is to have this and look down on somebody else I like who I am I have confidence in my ability I have confidence in my character I have confidence in my appearance this is alhamdulillah very good we should have this positive self image but because of this now I look down on somebody else then this is arrogance and in Islam this is haram there is no discrimination in Islam because the discri- discrimination is what look down on somebody else i am white so i look down on a, on someone who is not white i am i am not white so i look down on someone who is white i am male so i look down on someone who is female and vice versa and so on and so forth this is not permissible in islam so confidence is not arrogance please understand that nothing wrong in being confident as a matter of fact it is extremely important to be confident today the symbol of confidence of islam is the woman in the hijab the great uh, you know alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given honor to the sisters and that's why they are being attacked everywhere the world is terrified of a woman with in a hijab can you imagine is a, that is the pathetic state of the of the world but alhamdulillah we ask allah to protect all our sisters who have the confidence to wear the hijab but this is a symbol of confidence a woman in in, in a hijab is not looking down on anybody she is confident about herself about her identity and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for strength and protection from them so this is what the meaning of confidence is and this is the best example of the expression of this confidence is the first instance where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam demonstrated uh, he announced islam and of course his whole life is filled with many many incidents but as i said it's not my purpose here to uh, talk about all of them we talk about uh, the ones that we Uh, that are enough inshallah to illustrate the point that we are making we then come out of this to the point of courage now if you look at courage courage again comes out of confidence come courage again comes out of that feeling of being true uh, to ourselves now interestingly even in today's world where the issue of uh, physical courage seems to be uh, secondary actually it is not so physical courage is not only the issue of fighting battles physical courage is in every aspect of our lives physical courage is also moral courage the ability to stand up for the unpopular view the ability to stand to stand up for people who are being oppressed uh, all of this is part of that is also physical courage the ability to do all of that now in the life of rasul sallam the one of the finest examples of uh, uh, of courage is the battle of hanay where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was um, in the battle of hunain this was immediately after uh, fata makka so the soldiers the uh, two things about that army one was that this was the first time that the army of muslims was actually fully equipped because normally all all the other battles they were very badly equipped and uh, poorly equipped but in the battle of hunain they were fully equipped so that was one and secondly the other side of the story was that this army was the majority of the people were people who had recently come to islam after fata makkah so they were not people who uh, had undergone any form of tarbiyah with rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they were all muslims who were who had recently become muslim so the the kind of istiqamah the kind of strength um, the kind of uh, power that uh, abu bakar and omar and uh, talha and zubair and other people radhi allah anhum ajmain that they had uh, many of the people of uh, that army they didn't have all of that so when they uh, first encountered the hawazim the uh, people the, the of banu thaqif and hawazim the people of uh, uh, of taif and their and their uh, confederates the there was almost complete chaos because the hawazim were about 20000 of them 
and uh, not that every all the 20,000 attacked in the, in the same at the same time, but uh, in that first shock of battle, uh, the Muslims turned and ran. They literally, it was a rout. It was not even a retreat. It was a complete rout. It was a rout to such an extent that Abu Sufyan Radhiallahu was standing in his army. He was absolutely, you know, astonished, and he said, "Only the sea will stop them," meaning that they will run all the way to Jeddah. There's no, they're not going to stop before that. Uh, Umar al Khattab was there, he said, This is the Qadr of Allah. Meaning that we have lost this battle, it's gone. And he said, This is the Qadr of Allah. So people were losing hope, people were losing uh, courage. Um, Nabi sallallahu in that situation, he was riding a, a white mule, and uh, uh, Abdullah bin Masood al said that, I saw the Prophet going towards the enemy. Everyone else is running away. The Prophet Sallallahu alone is going towards. Not only is going towards, but he was riding his mule and he put up his hand and he was shouting and saying, I am Muhammad bin Abdul Muttalib. I am Muhammad bin Abdul Muttalib. So, Abdullah Masood says that uh, Sayyidina Ali and uh, Sayyidina Abbas and others, he says they grabbed the bridle of the mule, they tried to stop him and they said, Ya Rasulullah, they want you, if they kill you, the whole, everything is finished. This whole thing is about that. So, please don't expose yourself to danger. Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does not listen. He continues. Then Abdullah bin Masood said, he turned and he saw me. And he said, call the Ansar. Called the Ansar. And Abdullah also said, I called out and I said, Ya Ansar. Now, even among the Ansar, they were the Banu Najjar, who were the family of Rasulullah. Nabi said, uh, Abdullah Masood says that when I called the Ansar, they came. They came and they surrounded the Prophet. And he said that at that time there must have been about a hundred people or so. That's it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jala jala lahu, sent his aid. Abdullah ibn Masood said, We saw a black mass descend from the heavens. It hit the earth and it dispersed and it looked like ants. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what his armies are like. Allah knows who are the soldiers of his armies. But he said, This is what it looked like. It looked like ants dispersing. And the result of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, all of these ayat are in Surah Tawbah. So read them. The whole battle, the whole tide of battle turned. The Muslims won that battle. They got huge ghanimah. And so on and so on. So courage, physical courage. Now think about this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we know from his appearance and so on and so forth, that he was a person of uh, average height. He was a person of average build. He was not 10 feet tall and 4 feet wide, no. He looked as if he was the tallest if he was among people. But, he, but, but, but was he the tallest? No, he was not. He just appeared like that because of his confidence, the way he held himself and so on and so forth. Physical courage is not a factor of your strength or size. Physical courage is not a factor of the size of your biceps. There are people who, are, who look very strong, who are very strong, but they have no dil. So physical courage comes from personal confidence. Moral, that's why moral courage is a factor, is, is, is behind physical courage. Unless you have moral courage, you cannot have physical courage. And moral courage comes out of truthfulness. Moral courage comes out of the truth. Moral courage comes out of the ability, the confidence in what you are saying. This is the character of all the Anbiya alayhi wasalam. Take Ibrahim alayhi salam. One single man. One single man. Ibrahim alayhi salam had no ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kana ummah. Allah said, He is the ummah. He stand, he's standing up to the king, he's standing up to all the people. They want to throw him into the fire and burn him and all kinds of things. One man alone. By himself. How does he do that? That's courage. Musa alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had described that entire scene of Musa alayhi salam standing before Firaun in his, in his court. Alone by himself. He stick in his hand. And who is uh, Ramesses the fourth, the Pharaoh of Musa? 
he is the most powerful human being on the face of the earth at the time the king of the most powerful kingdom of the time master of the greatest wealth that anyone had at the time and in front of that king and these are you know to, we, we, today we have alhamdulillah this is a good thing but today we have no idea about the actual power of an absolute monarch yeah, when bush blair combine wanted to invade iraq they had to tell a lot of lies they had to build a lot of public opinion yeah you had colin powell had to go and uh, lie through his teeth before the general assembly of the united nations to try and build some well, what was the need for that they could have gone to no they could not have gone for war they they lot of public opinion has to be built and you know they have to create this entire edifice of lies of course alhamdulillah thanks to the uh, chilcot report and so on it collapsed on their heads but the kings of the old the absolute monarchs they didn't need to do any of that they just ordered and it happened the same pharaoh this pharaoh of musa alayhi salam ramses the fourth he is the one who ordered all the male children of the one is bani israel to be killed he didn't he didn't wait to build public support he didn't do a ad campaign before that no he had to do it it was done the historians have said that uh, ibn kathir and so on they have said that maybe 70000 children were killed Uh, ajeeb can you imagine that what kind of barbarity is that what kind of complete uh, raw power nothing else that is the man in front of whom musa alaihi salam is standing that same pharaoh if he wanted he could have had musa alaihi salam chopped into a khima into a mincemeat there's no fear in musa alaihi salam why because he is connected to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla courage comes from connection to allah courage is the factor of ta'alluq ma allah when the slave recognizes that la nafi wa la dharra illa allah then he gets courage when he realizes that nobody can harm and nobody can benefit illa allah except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you get courage courage is a factor of la ilaha illa allah muhammad rasulullah that is the way that courage comes and that courage is unshakable because it comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens the heart allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the person uh, gives the person that courage and as i said this is the characteristic of all the anbiya i gave you the example of uh, two but same thing you take isa alaihi salam take uh, all everyone all, all the anbiya courage is a factor of the truth of being on the truth and of being connected with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla out of this comes sabr fortitude now uh, what is what is sabr allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the issue of sabr when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu istainu bis sabri was salat inna allaha ma'a sabirin now sabr is uh, i mentioned this before many times but i think it's important to clarify that sabar is not simply to sit and do nothing sabar is not simply to sit and do nothing sabar is to do your best and then stand before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu and ask for his help right now inshallah we will uh, take a break for maghrib it's uh, i think time for salah now we'll take a break for maghrib and then we'll come back after maghrib to finish the rest of it inshallah mustan wa sallallahu ala nabiyil karim wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain bi rahmatika ya rahman rahim